Hi, thank you for joining us in worship today. We have a few quick announcements to run over before we get our services started. Enjoy Volt's famous spaghetti sauce. Proceeds go to the Vision of Light team in support of future mission trips. Ticket sales start March 6th through the 20th from 8.30 a.m. to 12.15 p.m. You'll be able to pick up your order by the South Entrance on March 27th. Registration is now open for the Easter Egg Scavenger Hunt. It'll be from 2 to 4 p.m. on the church campus. To register, visit cumc.com slash egg hunt. Join us for Sunday night dinner on March 27th. Dinner will be served at 5 p.m., but feel free to meet us in Underwood Hall beforehand just to reconnect with some members of your community. The cost of each dinner is $12 per person, and children under 12 eat free. You too can create change by donating throughout Lent. Help us meet our $5,000 goal by filling your jar with change and bringing it back on Palm Sunday for our special noisy offering. Your contributions will help purchase two water buffalo, two cows, two sheep, along with bees, chicks, and rabbits for a community in need. Every Easter, our sanctuary is decorated with beautiful lily flowers to celebrate the resurrection. You can dedicate one of these flowers in honor or in memory of someone you love. Visit cumc.com slash Easter flowers to purchase your lily today. Again, we are thankful to have you in worship with us this Sunday, and we hope that you continue to walk with us on our mission of loving God, serving others, and transforming lives here at Christ United. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you on a beautiful March Sunday morning. This is the third Sunday in the season of Lent. I'll be preaching today on a passage from the fifth chapter of Luke's Gospel, which I'm excited about. Uh, one quick announcement, uh, building on the last thing that Alex said there, Easter flowers. So if you would like to purchase a flower for uh, Easter in memory or uh, in honor of someone, you can do that by going online, cumc.com slash Easter flowers there. Or if you would prefer to, to talk to somebody the worship committee will be in the narthex uh, with, with, at a table, and you can order that way for the next few weeks between now and uh, Easter time. So Easter is on April 17th. Uh, okay, just one more note, and I'm going to bring this up because many Texas Tech fans have talked to me this morning. Um, my Fighting Irish, I'm wearing my, gold sh uh, my green shamrock tie. That's, okay, one Notre Dame fan in the back. Are playing Tex Texas Tech at 6.10 this evening. So if you would like to catch an excellent basketball game, don't talk to me about it if Notre Dame loses, but I'll celebrate with you next week. If they win, uh, go Irish. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good morning, I'm Reagan Gillen, pastor of adult discipleship here at Christ United. And right now I invite you to stand as you're able and join me in the call to worship. We are called here this morning to learn of Christ's healing love. Help us, O Lord, to learn your lessons of compassion. Every day there are many ways in which we can offer help to others. Help us, O Lord, to be ready to reach out to all in need. Come, let us worship the one who prepares us for service. Let us sing our songs of praise to the one who has healed us. Amen. Please remain standing as you are able and join in the singing of our opening hymn, O Christ the Healer, number 265.
Hello, I'm Mike Flynn, pastor of Care Ministries here at Christ United. I invite you to join me in the Apostles' Creed as we affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. for our children's time video. I'm so sorry. Well, let me know if there's anything I can do. I mean, I don't know what I can do, but let me know and I hope you feel better. Okay, bye. Oh my gosh. I just found out that one of my good friends is really sick. I wish there was something I can do, but I mean, what can I do? I'm not a doctor. I can't like heal them. Sometimes it can seem like there's just so much sadness, so many people with so many hurts in the world. How can we possibly help heal it all? I mean, Jesus was able to heal people, but um, duh, he's Jesus and I'm, well, just me. Do you have a minute? Yeah, what's up? Well, I need help organizing food for the food pantry, loading it into my car and making snack packs. I need help. I mean, yeah, but I have all my kids with me. Can they come too? Perfect. Something I learned today is that healing can look many different ways because hurts and injuries are not always visible on the outside. Now, I understand that healing the world might sound like a really big job, but that's one of the best things about our church is that we have people like Miss Lisa and the Serving Others Department that help us find ways that we can do even more than we thought we could. And you are never too old or too young to help. We can help heal the hurts. That is one reason that I am so excited about our Lenten mission with Heifer International. Because on our own, we might not seem like we could make a big difference. But when we all work together, we can change the world. We can begin healing the world one community at a time. Remember, God is with you everywhere you go, and each and every one of you is a beloved child of God. Mom, who are you talking to? It's my friends. I didn't know you had friends. I want to begin today with a, a basic premise. I know this may be an obvious point, uh, and I'm guessing everybody here is going to be on board with it, but I figured we'd go ahead and name it. My assumption is that, uh, theologically speaking, Jesus is the most important person in our lives. Again, uh, this is probably an obvious point since we all share a common faith in Christ, but being clear about this point is really an important foundation for us all. Now there are some caveats, of course, we're all in different places on our spiritual journeys. Uh, each of us may emphasize or resonate more with different aspects of Christian theology. There are certainly differences of opinion among us about some parts of the Bible. Depending on how long we've been around, each of us has varying levels of commitment to and investment in our spiritual life. 
And there are no doubt some folks here today who are brand new to the church, who are just beginning to figure out what it means to be a Christian. But if we consider ourselves to be disciples of Christ, to be followers of Christ, to be among those who have placed our faith in Christ, then theologically speaking, Jesus is indeed the most important person in our lives because his example, his teachings, his life, his death, his resurrection, everything that Jesus was, is, and will be shapes what we believe about God and about our relationship with God. It shapes how, what we believe about our relationships with each other. It shapes how we show up in the world. All of which means that from time to time, it's good to reflect deeply on just who he was, what he taught, what he did, how he lived, and what all of that means for us as his disciples. And that's going to be our focus throughout this season of Lent. This is the third week in our sermon series called An Extraordinary Life, A Lenten Journey with Jesus. Throughout this season of preparation for Easter, we're reading the story of Christ's ministry as told by the Gospel of Luke, which is the, the uh, recommended lectionary gospel for this year. And every week, our plan is to focus on a different aspect of his life. We're actually reading through uh, an overview of Luke um, chronologically. So our pastor of adult discipleship, Reverend Reagan Gilliland, preached the first two weeks of this series. We began with what is the traditional reading for the first Sunday in Lent each year, the temptation of Christ in the wilderness before his ministry began. And then last week we read the story of uh, Christ's first sermon in the synagogue of his hometown of Nazareth. Uh, both those stories are actually in the fourth chapter of Luke. Today we're gonna read from the fifth chapter and we're gonna read two consecutive stories that talk about Jesus' uh, healing ministry. So we'll read the first of those now. This is Luke chapter 5, verses 12 to 16. Listen, friends, for the word of God as it is proclaimed by God's servant, the evangelist Luke. Once, when Jesus was in one of the cities, there was a man covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you choose, you can make me clean. Then Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him, and said, I do choose, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he ordered him to tell no one. Go, he said, and show yourself to the priest and as Moses commanded, make an offering for your cleansing, for a testimony to them. But now more than ever, the word about Jesus spread abroad Many crowds would gather to hear him and to be cured of their diseases, but he would withdraw to deserted places and pray. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we talk about this particular aspect of Jesus' ministry, uh, we need to make an important distinction between two related but not identical words. Theologically speaking, healing and curing are, are not synonyms. Now, grammatically, at least in English, we often use these two terms uh, interchangeably, but when it comes to the ministry of Jesus, uh, curing is really just part of what it means to be healed. You know that cu to cure means uh, to eliminate or to take away an ailment or an illness. And in this first story for today, it means uh, a man comes to Jesus, quote unquote, covered with leprosy, that's what the text says, and then he went away without it. His leprosy was gone, uh, he was cured. And Luke tells us that that word got around. Verse 15 makes clear that the crowds gathered to be cured of their diseases. In Greek, uh, the word translated as cure in that 15th verse is therapeuo, as in therapeutic and in English, that word is frequently associated with medical remedies. Uh, but I'm not sure if you noticed, the man covered with leprosy actually did not ask Jesus for a cure. What he asked Jesus was to be made clean. That's katharizo in Greek, which is uh, where we get the word catharsis. That's a word in English that's very much about emotional and spiritual health. It's also the word in Greek that was used uh, for being made ritually clean. 
And when you were made ritually clean, you were able to participate in the religious life of the community because you see there are two entire chapters in the law of Moses Leviticus 13 and 14 devoted to the subject of leprosy that word leprosy uh, was used for a wide range of skin ailments in the biblical era some of them were very mild uh, all the way to uh, ailments that were very severe it was a wide range of of, uh, ailments that they used for the word that they used the word leprosy for and yes these were obviously physical diseases, but much more than that, uh, leprosy was a social disease that isolated the victim from other people. Leprosy made a person ritually unclean, and because of that fact, they were on the margins of society. They could not be touched by others, uh, and they were prevented from participating in religious services. What this man asks of Jesus is to be made clean. Yes, to be cured of his physical ailment, whatever that was, but much more importantly, to be restored to full participation in the community, which is to say, uh, Jesus' healing of this man goes far beyond the, the simple, albeit important, cure of his skin disease. When Jesus reaches out and, and touches the man, he actually violates the law. Jesus himself would have been made unclean by that act, but he's making a a theological point that compassion and kindness and love are more important than the restrictions of the law. As he so often did, Jesus was teaching by his actions that true healing requires more than simply a physical cure, that true healing has to include breaking through the isolation that so often accompanies illness. And that made me think of our care ministries here at Christ United. Our pastor of care ministries, Reverend Mike Flynn, along with our new uh, assistant director of care ministries, Janet Scheibel, along with our incredible team of volunteers, offer uh, really a, a wide range of ministries that break through the isolation that too often accompanies illness and the death of a loved one. You may know this. We have a prayer ministry. We have cancer support, we have grief support, we have Stephen ministry, we have pastoral care and counseling, we have a lay chaplain ministry, we have assisted living ministry, the list goes on. The staff and volunteers in our care ministries uh, visit those who are hospitalized and they deliver meals when people are sick, they provide hospitality for funerals, they they provide uh, compassionate spiritual care during life's valleys and hardships. They visit with those who are unable to be physically present with their community of faith, including some who are worshiping online right now. Our care ministries embody the truth that that Jesus taught in our reading today, that, that healing involves much more than simply a physical cure. Of course, we trust uh, our medical professionals to focus on the medicine, but as the church, what we believe is that the broader understanding of healing very much involves disciples uh, caring for one another. So this is my pitch. If you are in need of care ministries and have not yet done so, please reach out to Mike. He's mike at cumc.com, or you can talk to him after the service today. And perhaps just as importantly, if you feel called to volunteer in any way, you can visit cumc.com slash care to learn more, and then reach out to Mike or Janet to find out how you can serve. Okay, let's read the second story. This is Luke chapter 5, verses 17 to 26. Listen again, friends, for God's word. One day while Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting nearby. They had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Just then, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a bed. They were trying to bring him, in, uh, bring him in and lay him before Jesus, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, Who is this? who is speaking blasphemies? Who can 
forgive sins but God alone. When Jesus perceived their questionings, he answered them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven you or to say stand up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the one who was paralyzed, I say to you, stand up and take your bed and go to your home. Immediately he stood up before them, took what he had been lying on, and went to his home glorifying God. Amazement seized all of them, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen strange things today. Amen. So in the biblical era, there was this idea that if you were sick in some way, Uh, Chances are you had done something wrong. You had sinned, and God was punishing you in some way. Uh, We obviously don't believe that anymore, but that's part of what's going on between uh, in this passage about the forgiveness of sins. Um, I actually want to set that aside for now. Uh, This is a a pretty, pretty famous story from Jesus' ministry. It appears in three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all included in their account of the life of Jesus. And when I was reading it through, This time around, there were two uh, details that were particularly striking for me. The first is that this man's healing was entirely the result of the persistence and advocacy of his friends. He never would have gotten to Jesus were it not for his friend's commitment. I think that tells us something about how our healing is very much tied to our people, (laughs) whoever our people may be. Anyone who has battled a significant injury or an illness will readily bear witness to this truth. We need the the loving help of others if we are going to truly and completely heal. Every single one of us at one point or another in our lives will need the kindness, the care, the compassion, the commitment of others. When we need healing, we need our family. We need our friends. We need our faith community. And I think I think this story makes that point in a powerful way. The other thing that strikes me about this passage is a detail that's actually unique to Luke. As I said, Matthew, Mark, uh, and Luke all tell this story. All three of those evangelists tell us that uh, the reaction of the crowd to this man's healing included amazement and awe. All three of them tell us that they glorified God, and, and all of that makes sense, of course. It was an incredible demonstration by Jesus of the power of God. The healing ministry of Christ deserves our amazement and our awe. But only Luke gives this, what I think is a fascinating detail. According to Luke, the crowd says, we have seen strange things today. Which means that this crowd watches this scene. They watch these committed friends go to extraordinary lengths to uh, get someone they love to Jesus. They watch this previously paralyzed man at Jesus' command, stand up and walk home, (laughs) and their reaction to this incredible, touching event is to say, boy, that was weird. (laughs) That's a terrible reaction (laughs) to what they had just seen. Now, it may have been strange to some, but to those of us who understand Jesus to be the most important person in our lives, it's actually not strange at all because this is what we expect of Jesus, right? We know that healing was an important part of his ministry. We know that Jesus heals even when, uh, as is sometimes, perhaps it's better to say too often, tragically the case, uh, we don't get the medical cure that we were so desperately hoping for. It was near the end of our first year in Henrietta back in 2011, uh, this time of year, and I was just about to walk into the Good Friday service when my wife Whitney came into my office. She was clearly distraught. She had uh, gotten word from Michigan that her dad was heading to the emergency room. She had been in Ann Arbor earlier in that week for his last lecture at the University of Michigan. Gary had taught industrial engineering there for almost 40 years. He was finally retiring. We had heard a lot about it as a family. He had all these big plans with all of us after he had retired. And she had noticed uh, earlier in the week that he had seemed 
off, like something was, was bothering him, but she had chalked it up to, you know, this major life transition. A few days later, a, a long-term friend, long-time friend, noticed that his balance was shaky, and he had some um, unexplained confusion, and so he and my mother-in-law went to the hospital. A series of tests over the weekend confirmed the worst possible news on Easter Sunday morning. Uh, he was diagnosed with stage four esophageal cancer that had already spread to his brain and to his bones. Uh, his prognosis at that point was measured in months. And when we made the announcement in church, uh, a longtime leader in the congregation who had only known us for a few months at this point now, came up to Whitney after worship. She hadn't even gotten out of her pew when Jerry stopped her. And he said, what do you need? You need plane tickets? You need me to preach for Chris for a few weeks so y'all can go to Michigan? You just tell us what you need. And that was the start of a summer of incredible support by our church. There was never a question that the church would do whatever they could to support us. Whitney and the boys uh, ended up spending most of that summer in Ann Arbor uh, while I traveled back and forth as I could. Friends uh, of the family spent that summer surrounding Whitney's parents with love and support and food and food, so much food. You know how that goes. Every bit of it appreciated. Looking back 11 years later now, those long, difficult months are um, really mostly a blur in my memory, but a few things do clearly stand out in my mind. The first being the incredible love and support of family and friends and the church. Another is that uh, we all had a chance to tell Gary what he meant to us, to say things that might have been left up unsaid to that point. Not every family gets that, uh, that gift. It's hard, those conversations, but they are certainly a blessing. I remember the way uh, all of us, all of his people, his wife, his kids, their spouses, the grandkids, um, all of us gathered around his bed the night before he died, holding hands and naming what we loved about him. <laughs> it's always going to be one of the holiest moments of my life. And he wasn't conscious by that point, uh, but I have no, I, no doubt that he knew we were there. A few weeks before he died, I was sitting in the living room of the house in Ann Arbor. One morning, I was doing my, my daily devotional routine, and Gary walked in. He, he sat uh, down in the chair next to me, and he did something he had never done before. Uh, he had always been supportive of my call to ordain ministry. He had been at my ordination. He always enjoyed coming to church when they visited. He um, loved hearing me preach after I had uh, pr presided at my brother-in-law's wedding. So Whitney's older brother, his son, he asked me if I would do his funeral someday. And I told him, not anytime soon, but sure. But we had never really talked about faith, never really talked about faith until that moment. And that morning, we talked about God, we talked about the Bible, we talked about eternity. And I asked him, what's a pretty, pretty pastorish question, I asked him what he believed about what comes after this life. He said, Chris, I believe in Jesus and I believe in heaven. Uh, I just don't necessarily believe everything the church says. I assured him that none of us does, <laughs> not, a, not even those of us who are in the business, right? Jesus was perfect, the church is not. Um, and I was in that moment uh, at peace that he was at peace about what comes next. I had the honor of telling that story a few weeks later when I made good on my promise that I had made to him and I preached his funeral. And I thanked everyone who had packed the sanctuary at First United Methodist Church of Ann Arbor, the, the church where Whitney and I had gotten married, the church where she had walked, uh, he had walked her down the aisle. I thanked everybody there uh, for all the ways that they had shown love and kindness to our family during those difficult months. And though most of that summer is a blur, of heartache and sadness, I'm grateful that the memories I do have are beautiful examples of healing. <laughs> I'm talking about the emotional healing that comes through the love of family and friends and the church. 
uh, when we show up for each other in the hardest times. If there is no other reason to join the church, and believe me, I think there are plenty of reasons to join the church, but if there are no others, having support like that in the toughest times is, is it. <laughs> And I'm talking about the spiritual healing that comes with the assurance that we have that, that what comes after this life is good even when this life doesn't end the way we had wanted or expected. I'm talking about healing that abounds even when modern medicine is unable to provide the cure that we so long for. And of course, it's the most important person in our lives who makes all of that possible. Friends, part of what makes Jesus' life so extraordinary is that he had, he has today, and he will always have the power to heal us in a way that no one else can. I don't know what else to say about that other than thanks be to God. Amen.
We now come to our time for prayers of the people. Before we pray, a note of the flowers in our sanctuary this morning are given in loving memory of Lou Sanford, mother of Martha Desai and Linda Mehta. So we give thanks to God for the life and the memory of Lou. Also a reminder that you can submit a prayer online anytime at cumc.com prayer, as well as on the prayer wall in our chapel. And our prayer ministry team will pray daily for all of your prayer requests. Now, after each prayer is read, I invite you all to respond with the words, Lord, hear our prayer. So let us go to God now in prayer. Holy and loving God, we are so grateful for your spirit who continues to transform each of us into the likeness of Jesus each day. May you help us to show your love to those who are in need so they can also know that they too are your beloved children. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for the continued violence that affects so many people, both here in our country and all around the world. We also lift up the people of Ukraine, especially those who have been forced to leave their loved ones and their homes as a result of the ongoing attacks. Please be with them as you guide them to a place of safety and rest. Lord, hear our prayers. May you also be with your church around the world. Help us to stand against all powers of darkness and injustice in whatever ways they show themselves. Help us to be a light of your compassion and your justice for everyone. Lord, hear our prayers. And we always remember and pray for those who are facing and struggling with illness, those who are in the hospital facing uncertainty in their lives, those who are continuing to struggle with loss and grief. May they know your comfort as we reach out to them with love and support. Lord, hear our prayers. We ask all these things in Christ's holy name and we pray together now as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come now to the time where we uplift our tithes and offerings, but first, we are so glad you're worshiping with us this morning, whether you're in person or if you're joining us online, and we want to know that you're here so we can connect with you. There's a couple ways you can do that if you're in person. You can sign in uh, by using a QR code on the back of your bulletin, or there are cards in the back of your pew that you can sign and put in the offering plate. If you're joining us online on Facebook, you can simply like or comment. If you're watching from the website, you can sign in. Here at Christ United, we have um, several, several ministries and many that have been going on for um, even decades. And this morning we have the chance to see a video of one of our most beloved ministries. I was taking a personal growth course in the fall of 2001. And on September 11th of 2001, the whole nation was hit by a catastrophe that meant significant changes had to happen. I took a following course, and in that course, they said, go out and do something for your community. I proposed the men's service group at Christ United Methodist Church to be that thing that would make a difference. It's always been wonderful. We called on them for fun times. We called on them for projects around our house, and then they helped me tremendously as I moved from a a home. In the apartment, they've done shelves. They helped me move some things in. Um, they're working today on a stained glass window hanging that I wanted there. I came up with this crazy idea to have a float in the July the 4th Plano Parade that would represent our church. And those guys kind of scratched their heads and then they went to work and they just made 
fantastic structures. They're always willing to take my crazy ideas and go with them. You know, Men's Service Group has served so many people through the years, but I think the, what might be the secret ingredient, our sauce for Men's Service Group, as well as so many of our other, is that these men are being served as well. They are finding spiritual fulfillment doing just what Jesus asked us to do, love God and serve others. And so that's, that's really been the key to the Men's Service Group and all of our other efforts at reaching people. The Men's Service Group has traditionally provided home maintenance and repair services to the singles and seniors in our congregation who may lack the means or the ability to do those tasks themselves. I always tell the guys, you're out there doing many little things, but you're doing them with great love. And that can make a big difference in the lives of some people. Now, some guys may be under the mistaken impression that you have to be really handy to be part of MSG. Well, I can tell you, just ask my wife or any of the guys in the group, and they'll be quick to tell you, I'm the least handy guy in the bunch. But you know what? I love fixing breakfast for the guys. I love working out in the yard. I can replace light bulbs, smoke alarm batteries, and do other little things around the house. And you know what? That's really all it takes to help somebody else out. And you can have a lot of fun doing it, too, with the other guys. I'm really excited about the future of MSG. We'll continue to do the home maintenance and repair services that we've always done. But as technology changes and continues to evolve, I see all sorts of new opportunities to help out the congregation and to get the youth of our church involved as well. In March 2013, a cold, sleet-filled, overcast day, the first MSG happened with just 13 brave men going out into the, almost the wilderness to take care of three different clients. Today, we have over 100 such brave men and they're doing the same kinds of things. And so for 20 years now coming up, We'll be blessed to continue to do that for the next 20 years with the same culture that we started in 2002. So one of the scriptures today reminded me of how we get by with the help of others. And this church is so wonderful at um, being there for one another, whether it is something like moving furniture or going to a hospital and praying with someone. This church is so committed to helping one another. And it's through your generosity and through your time and your gifts that so much is able to happen. So we thank you so much for all the ways in which you give here at Christ United. Um, you touch so many lives and serve so many lives that you may not even know about. So thank you.
I invite you to remain standing as we join together in our closing hymn, number 526, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
Please be seated. If you have decided that today is the, the day you want to take the next step in your journey of faith, if you've been visiting for, with us for a while and are considering joining, if you uh, want to go to the Get Connected table as you leave the sanctuary, it'll be straight ahead of you. We can tell you about the United Methodist Church. We can tell you about Christ United. We can offer you the vows of membership, um, whatever you need to get connected. There was, in the mid-2010s, there was a movie that came out. It wasn't like a big blockbuster or anything, but it was called The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. If you've never seen that movie, I'd recommend it to you. It's really good. Uh, and it was coming on Holy Week, and we watched it, and there's a great line in that movie. Uh, Everything will be all right in the end. If it is not all right, it is not yet the end. <laughs> and I think that's pretty good theology, even though they didn't intend it that way. Uh, I've been doing this a while, and I've heard stories of people that had uh, these kind of miraculous cures from very grave diseases. And then I've walked with people that I know and love uh, who didn't get the cure. But what I know with the certainty of my faith is that Jesus heals nonetheless <laughs> through one another, through the community of faith, and through the great promise of our faith that what comes next is good. So, as we go back out into the world, may we take that assurance that Jesus heals with us. Amen.